Welcome to Just Kidding Around, a special all-kids edition of Missouri Outdoors. We're getting ready to explore the underworld with a restoration trip into one of Missouri's caves. Come on! This is the entrance at Lone Hill Onyx Cave near Sullivan, Missouri. And these are the students from Sullivan Middle School. They're teaming up with cave experts from the Missouri Department of Conservation to clean up this heavily used cave. Hopefully we'll be able to get things back just a little closer to their natural state. And in the process, we're going to learn a lot about caves, cave life, and cavers. So grab your lights and helmets for a trip down under. We're just kidding around underground. Coming up. to a cave is always an exciting place, and our trip was no different. Most of us had been in a cave before, but they were what are called commercial or show caves. Caves altered with electric lights and walkways for public tours. This was a wild cave. No lights, no sidewalks. It was a new experience for most of us. A few last minute words, some quick adjustments, and we're ready. It's lights, action, caving. We could see right off that this wasn't going to be easy. If we wanted to experience this cave, we were going to have to work for it. Okay guys, now we're going to go into a crawlway, and this is where your gloves are going to come in handy because we're going to be crawling on gravel. It's kind of wet and muddy, but it won't be for too long, okay? Ready? <laughs> The effort was worth it. Following the crawlway, the passage opened up. Huge rooms and beautiful formations, a whole new world. It's neat to see how all this is like nature and nobody actually formed it like that. It's really pretty in here. It's been really neat to see all the little animals and stuff. And we saw like salamander tadpoles over in that other room. Wow, that's so cool. Isn't that beautiful? Lone Hill Onyx Cave, while exciting for us, is a fairly simple outing for experienced cavers. Let's look in on another crew of expert explorers as they challenge the unknown and truly go where no man has gone before. There is a place on Earth where light never penetrates. A place that exists in geologic time slowly forming, drop by drop. It's a place where few people ever venture. Underground, Missouri. Doug Baker is a cave cartographer. Doug and other members of the Cave Research Foundation are producing a complex and highly detailed map of Powder Mill Creek Cave near the current river. Maps that we've been making in recent years are extremely detailed and it's a big jump from what earlier cave maps were. And I think what drives us to do that, part of it is just trying to show the cave like it really is, try to capture the feel of it as much as we can. It can be used for biological inventories, geological studies, but probably the number one use is just curiosity. What does the thing do? How do things relate to one another? On the next mapping trip, members of the Cave Research Foundation will explore and chart an unknown section of the cave beyond a particularly difficult passage known as the Hell Hole. They will literally go where no man has gone before. There, I got the lock. Powder Mill is one of the few caves in the state dedicated to research. A steel gate near the entrance protects the fragile ecosystem found within. Okay, that's it on him. Part of the team's research is a biological inventory a listing of all life found in the cave. Early in the trip, they are surprised to find an adult beaver and her den quite a distance from the entrance. Deeper into the cave, the team approaches the hellhole section. 
It is a tight, partially water-filled crawlway that must be traversed to reach the unexplored passage beyond, where the mapping can begin. Hey guys, it looks like it's opening up up here ahead. Following the hellhole passage, the team, now wet, cold, and hungry from several hours underground, prepares to begin to survey uncharted portions of the cave. Lights on station. Gun for compass. First time I was asked to actually read a compass and taught how to do that, it started changing my whole outlook on caves. Caves started offering something much more than a physical outlet. They started offering an opportunity to understand the world, to understand what an ecosystem is, to understand how I impact a cave, and then in turn to realize that I am very much impacted by it. For members of the Cave Research Foundation, it will be several long hours before they see the sun again. Hours of hard, tedious work in the most difficult and demanding conditions. The reward? A greater understanding of this complex ecosystem and the satisfaction of filling in one of the blank spots on the map. are the only mammals capable of true flight. More importantly, they play an important part in the control of insect populations. Each year, bats consume thousands of tons of night-flying insects. In fact, they can eat up to half of their body weight in insects during a night. It's such a strange world, all about mud, rock, and water. But there's life here, too. A lot of very special creatures call the underworld home. This is the cave salamander, which has got good eyes. It's got big, bulging eyes. It can see real well in dim light. But they will go way back in the dark zone of the cave, and they eat insects. Pretty nice, huh? Did you see the patterns on it? Now, over here we've got a column where a stalactite and a stalagmite join together. And there's some more just past here. Okay, we're looking at an eastern pipistrelle bat here. If we keep our voices down, he probably will just keep sleeping while we look at him. This is one of the few bats that will tolerate humans looking at them closely. They hibernate very deeply in the winter. And notice the folded up wing here. You see how pink that is? When I think about cave life, I think about bats. And you know, I really didn't want to get too cozy with them, but the more I learned about them, I found out they weren't that scary after all. In fact, they're kind of cute. Let's take a closer look at these fascinating creatures with some researchers working the night shift. Well, endangered species are important. They're indicators of what's happening to the environment. Wildlife biologist Rich Clawson is concerned about bats. Of the 13 species of bat native to Missouri, two are considered endangered, and one species, the Indiana bat, is declining rapidly. Clawson's job is to find out why. We're trying to understand more about the distribution of bats, um, mist netting surveys in parts of the state where people really haven't studied them in the past. The technique we use to collect bats is we use a system with mist nets. These are a, a fine mesh net with one and a quarter inch mesh, uh, very similar to a, a hair net. After darkness falls, it's time to check the net. McGinsey is an experienced bat handler and works without gloves for greater sensitivity while removing the bats from the net. Bats have been known to carry disease, however, and bats found on the ground should never be handled without protection. In other words, don't try this at home. Gosh. Nice and soupy tonight. Back at camp, the bats are examined. OK. 
Okay, what we have here is a little northern long-eared bat. The data is recorded, and the talk, quite naturally, concerns bats. Yeah, it's been shown that uh, little brown bats can eat up to 300 mosquitoes an hour, which is an awful lot of insects. Oh, wow. Another As the night wears down. on, there will be frequent trips back to the net, bats to examine, data to log, all to gain a little more information about one of Missouri's strangest and most beneficial creatures. It's very difficult to use gloves. The bat. Bats will lose up to one half of their body weight during the winter. If they are disturbed too often, they could run out of fat too soon and starve to death. If you have too many mosquitoes and unwelcome insects around, put out an invitation to bats. Building a bat box is fun and easy and the reward is fewer pests. You'll need rough sawn cedar or scraps of white pine and a few nails. Carefully measure the pieces, following the instructions, then get an adult to cut the pieces out for you. It's similar to building a birdhouse, but instead of cutting an entrance hole, we'll leave the bottom open. The interior dividers are really close together, but that's the way bats like it. Mount the box high off the ground in a warm, sunny location. The bats will find the box and your bugs. If you'd like the building plans, just write to us. We'll have the address for you at the end of the show. <laughs> Often you can narrow down the identification of an animal call by taking the habitat into consideration. For example, there's only one habitat where you'd hear this sound. Is that a slimy salamander, a black bear, a pickerel frog, or a gray bat? It's a pickerel frog. It doesn't sound like any other frog, and it's kind of scary, especially since you'll be in a cave when you hear it. Missouri caves, jeweled treasures, and natural wonders tucked beneath the Earth's surface. Have you ever wondered what it would be like to go inside the heart of a cave without leaving home? Now you can, thanks to an award-winning science teacher and her 7th graders at Whitfield School in West St. Louis County. How is this tour possible? Through the Internet. It all started back in 1994, when science teacher Liz O'Keefe began collecting water samples from Missouri Cave to bring back to her students. They compare their results with an earlier study of groundwater pollution in caves. Each year, the Whitfield Project tests about 2,200 samples to determine if the water in caves is becoming more polluted. Today, uh, we will be doing some water testing for um, five different caves. The results are compiled onto various charts and graphs. It is this information that is published and updated yearly on the Internet. But they realized they were only scratching the surface. We just thought it'd be kind of cool to do like a virtual cave tour, and, you know, put it up on the internet so, you know, the information could be available to any other person. How many people can really go to a cave and see what a cave is like? We wanted to share the beauty of all aspects of caves with the world, and we chose Onondaga Cave for our filming site. Special grants provided the necessary funding, but the class needed help to actually implement this technical endeavor. They turned to multimedia programmers at the University of Missouri in Columbia. The process started on paper in the form of a storyboard. The characters and concepts of the website were designed and approved by Miss O'Keefe. 
At the same time, a team of artists were creating the graphics. Four characters were created to actually walk you through the various portions of the internet site. Special cameras were brought into Onondaga Cave to capture panoramic images for the virtual reality tour. We're trying to recreate the experience that you're in a cave. So we can recreate the sights with photographs, we can recreate the sounds, but we can't quite recreate the temperature yet. So we kind of joke that, you know, you could set your temperature to 57 degrees in the room where you're at, actually. Uh, but I don't think anyone's done that. One of the first characters you will meet on the tour is Mo, the mobile Omni Explorer. He's a robot from the 1950s. It is through his eyes that we can look around the cave. <laughs> Hello, I am Mo, the mobile Omni Explorer, and I've been traveling all around this cave. Which part do you want to see? Special software is needed to enjoy this virtual reality tour. And although the website is finished, Miss O'Keefe plans to continue to take her seventh grade students on a yearly field trip to the Onondaga Cave. And of course, the water studies will continue for years to come. Oh, it's fabulous. Um, they have like computers on it and you can go for tours and it's just really neat and it's new technology. So I thought it was really cool. I hope that other kids can um, get an interest in caves and then try and um, preserve them and save them for the environment and do experiments like we're doing. Want to look around the cave? Sure! <laughs>
We're going to have several interesting things for you to, to learn about tomorrow in the cave. We'll look at some bats, maybe we'll see a salamander in the cave, and then we're going to do our part for cave conservation by trying to scrub some mud off some cave formations in the cave. And cavers have a rule of thumb that they follow, a, a special model. Take nothing but pictures, leave nothing but footprints, kill nothing but time. Water and a little elbow grease was all it took to restore this beautiful formation. But I think the cave provided us far more than we could ever return. We're not the first to make this journey underground. Caves have always played an important part in Missouri history. Let's take a look at how caves were used in times past. Darkness. For millions of years, caves in Missouri existed in perpetual night. No light to illuminate the dazzling formations. No way to see the dozens of creatures that call this unique habitat home. Nothing but blackness. But sometime, in the distant past, light came to the underground world. Certainly, Missouri cave resources have been utilized from the very beginning of the time when, when man entered Missouri. And they continue to be used to this very day. To the Paleo Indians are the, uh, the period of history from about 10,000 to 20,000 uh, years ago. Uh, caves were a, a very essential means of survival to those early cultures. It's that mystique of wanting to find out what's around the next corner. And the fact that caves are totally dark and that provides a great deal of mystery. But we have always been a people who liked adventure, who liked to explore. Uh, people came west because they were attracted to the resources in these areas. In the 1700s, settlers from the east began to enter the state of Missouri. Like the Native Americans before them, they used caves for shelter and protection. But they found another resource in caves necessary for survival, one of the ingredients in gunpowder. And where the bats use a cave, they leave guano on the floor, and they could extract this material, process it, and come up with saltpeter crystals, which combined with sulfur and charcoal produces gunpowder. The growth of communities brought on new needs, and new uses were found for Missouri's caves. Their spring-fed streams were used for mills. The cool temperature was used as cold storage. In St. Louis, caves were used as ice houses and as breweries. The turmoil of the Civil War brought violence and chaos to the state, and Missouri's caves were no exception. With their stores of saltpeter for gunpowder, caves were a valuable commodity, eagerly sought by both sides in the conflict. Quantrill's irregulars were said to have destroyed gunpowder mills in Merrimack caverns, giving rise to the rumor that Jesse James, one of Quantrill's men, later used the cave as a hideout. In an era of bandits and bushwhackers, the darkness may have taken on a new significance. Then came the automobile and the electric light. Suddenly, caves transformed from utilitarian shelters to tourist attractions. Caves went commercial, and Missouri established its reputation as the cave state. At this time in Missouri history, Caves were commercialized in many ways. They modified the caves, they put in walkways, they put in platforms and they used the caves for dance halls and beer gardens and roller rinks, all kinds of social activities. Following World War II, when we had better roads, they began to open caves for tourism. There's been no time since the beginning of this period that we haven't had at least two dozen show caves open to public. But Missouri's cave resources don't stop with the commercial caves. There are more than 5,000 known caves in the state, and more are being located every year. These underground sanctuaries provide a unique ecosystem for dozens of exotic creatures. They are valuable living laboratories, a place to study our groundwater resources. And they have provided adventure and excitement to generations of explorers. When light penetrates the darkness, the results can be astounding.
After a long day underground, we began our trudge toward the light. Tired, but satisfied, knowing that we were leaving this cave just a little bit cleaner than it was when we arrived. Ah, daylight. You know, it's been fun, but there's nothing like a little sunlight to brighten up your day. It's great to be back in the Missouri outdoors.